uh, they were little and they got bullied um, and being able to make jokes, being able to get everybody to laugh mm. was a way of saving your own life. Mm. Are you, w was there any of that in, in, in your... Not, not much. I mean, I, um, everybody got bullied. I don't think I got bullied any more than anyone else. And I hope I didn't bully anybody more than anyone else did. But I wouldn't think of myself in that... And you fitted in all right. Sort of, yeah, I fitted in all right. Sport was the key to fitting in. If you could play sport, you were... No worries. Um, so, no, I don't think that. But I do think that, it, that life, can be, life could be pretty boring if we didn't make it funnier. And I was always trying to make things more entertaining and loving it when other people did it. I did, did genuinely did see it as a group thing. One of the things that happened when I started doing Fred Dagg is that I had to admit that I was now doing it alone. And I'd previously always done it in a group. It was a collaborative, um, broader conversation, if you like. And I had to turn it into a sort of business with, as I said, some, some product and some retail and some a bit of mechanics and a bit of copyright protection and I had to learn a little bit about that and do that. Um, but, but it was what I'd always liked doing and when I was doing Fred Dagg on my own, um, which I loved doing, the best bits, of it, best bits of it were when I wasn't doing it alone. It was when I was talking to you or talking to being interviewed or I'd been able to set something up where there was some communication. Because humour is a kind of... Um, a tone, perhaps, in communication. A very effective one, and often a shorthandy one. Quick. We, we, we both ended up following Noel Coward's advice that um, television, dear boy, is not for looking at, it's for being on. Hmm. For the people who didn't grow up with him, <coughs> who was Fred Dagg? Where did, where did he come from? Well, New Zealand... Um, until about an hour ago, was um, uh, principally a primary industry economy. It, um, and until the 60s, it was a primary industry feeder colonial economy for Britain. It was set up like that, and those, its mechanisms were producer boards and companies that were sent out from Britain and all that. Um, and um, when I was doing economics at university, um, Th this was about to change and there was going to be quite a shakeout in the New Zealand economy. Nobody told the government that, that Britain was going to go into the EEC. It might have been a little easier on New Zealand if somebody had mentioned it um, in public. But it was certainly studied quite widely. Um, and we all kind of uh, knew that it was going to happen. But when it was a primary producer economy, the farmer was the kind of metaphor for what we did as a country. The biggest television program was Country Calendar, which once a week beamed into the houses of the nation and it brought with it stuff that was happening outside the cities. So the people in the cities were filling in forms and stuff, but the guts of the work was going on out in the country. And so I realised that when I wanted to do something on television that had some impact, I needed to find a character which was easy for me to do, and it was because it was just a sort of a way of talking, um, uh, had a recognisable kind of iconography which would be a hat, a black singlet. I'd spent a lot of my time at university in shearing gangs, so I knew exactly how... And I was always, Fred Dagg was always around sheep. You'll notice he was never around cattle. I didn't know much about cattle, but... Sheep, that's cool. Um, <clears throat> I can shear a sheep. Um, so I got the kit and the sort of backstory from the New Zealand rural sector. And Fred then had a capacity to talk about anything. He wasn't limited by the farm gate. He could talk about anything that's encompassable by the language. That was basically the idea. Cause I was, he, was, he, was he modelled on anyone you knew? No, but I had some um, very amusing uncles who, who had farms and were pretty good talkers. I had an uncle, for example, who reckoned he had a dog who could spell. Um, <coughs> and um, 
the dog who could spell uh, was a bit of a sensation in the district and every now and again he would allow himself to be prevailed upon to demonstrate. The dog's name was Dune. And, um, and my uncle would sit Dune over there and go over there to the back of the truck and he'd say, you ready, Dune? And there'd be a bit of a crowd built up at the stockyards and then he'd say, UP Dune. UP. And the dog would get up. And people would go, geez, that's amazing, that dog can spell. <laughs> no, no one ever said, make it get D-O-W-N. <laughs> he just trained the dog to get on the back of the truck when he said U-P. Dog couldn't, obviously couldn't spell. And he had a, he had, he had a chook who could speak French. <laughs> he had, uh, and he did just to sort of invent it. So, I'd, so this imaginative world that sat legitimately around the real world was what had always intrigued me. A lot of the, the force of Fred Dagg, I think, comes from that um, absolutely unique voice. Did you build the character up from the voice? Yeah. Did you I, have a voice for the character before you, yes. you sort of had anything else? Yes. Yes, it always amused me that the New Zealand blokes would get incredibly serious over stuff that didn't matter in order to be manly, and their voices would drop a bit. And if you'd hear a group of them at an airport or at a football or something, and the sound of the group was, <laughs> and you think, that's not the way they normally talk. It's not the way they talk at home. That's bloke behaviour. They're members of the blokes' union. Um, and that always, I always thought that was funny because it's a kind of, there's an insecurity in that. I mean, it's a, it pretends to be a security, but it's an insecurity, and in the insecurity is a kind of shyness and an inadequacy and a playfulness. You've got an incredible ear for, for accent and for, for, for vocal character. Um, and I, I just remember that you said at one stage that you lived up the road from the legendary Peter Kelly. Oh, yeah, Peter lived in Palmerston North, and he was a race caller. <coughs> he was. <coughs> excuse he was. Me, he, he was the race. He caller. was the race caller, and he was a. He was a an auctioneer. At the yearling sales, the price of the yearlings would rise when he came on as the auctioneer. He was absolutely brilliant. He was a slightly electrifying talker, and he. And I'd heard him on the radio because on a Saturday when I was a kid, you played rugby, and then you went home and you had a bath, and you listened to in the in the bath you listened to Ernie Ormrod with bands on parade and you listen to the cancellations for the footy for the afternoon and there are quite a few of them in Palmerston because there's a bit of weather in that area and you listen to the races in the afternoon and Peter Kelly did all of the races in the lower part of the North Island and I knew his voice before I met him and I remember going around to pick my sister up um, one day and she was at a place that was next to Peter and I knew Peter vaguely by this stage, and Peter said to me, and it was an absolute revelation, he said, hello, John, it's a beautiful day for this time of the year, I do believe, not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> and I thought, this is not an act. This is, Peter talks like this all the time. <laughs> so I used to talk to Peter as much as I possibly could and ask him stuff, and Peter talked like that all the time. It was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and a couple of times I went to the races with Peter and watched him doing the commentary. And it was, it was just, I mean, you could sell tickets. It was absolutely wonderful. So when I was at university and I started getting, in, started getting involved in stage shows and things, the things that I thought were funny were from our lives in New Zealand. Sounds we knew, stories we'd heard, places we'd been, fools we'd elected. Um, I thought, you know, um, it was our place. And, um, and Peter Kelly was one of those sounds and I always wrote a race call uh, for somebody to do sometimes me. Paul Holmes did a, a couple of them and I, but I always did them because, and they've got a lovely rhythm. A lot of, a lot of the humour in language is in the rhythm. Brian and I will often do one of these interviews and we'll do, we'll, we'll have a script because I write a script and then we can maybe vary it a little bit, but it's essentially the script and we'll do it three times. And we, in fact, did one for tonight. There's one on television tonight. We did it three times. 
exactly the same script. The third one is funny. So the words are the same. It's the rhythm. And you know yourselves when you're talking to people who you're making fun with, you're, you're being creatively amusing with, that it's very often the rhythm. It's when somebody says something or it's the, the rhythm of some other thing that you've picked up and embodied in the, in what you're, in the stuff you're making up. It's you, a crea it's just, there's a level of creative excitement. It's really delicious. You did, you did a race happens. call on a flea race. I did. That I recall. Do you remember it? I don't really, but I remember that I was, I had, this is when I was doing Fred Dagg and I was on my own and I had a flea race where I was imagining that there was a race of fleas down here and they, no, which didn't, to be honest with you, they weren't really there, Ian. <laughs> um, but, uh, but one of them was called Daggy Boy and I wanted, and Fred Dagg wanted Daggy Boy to win. So the race calls, you know, this time and they're on the journey for the first time, whatever it was, the race, and then they took off and something and Daggy Boy would be going very nicely at the first turn, somebody would get in front of Daggy Boy and I'd tread on him. <laughs> so by the end of the race, Daggy Boy romped home comfortably in the, and there was a podium finish with a bit of a collect for Frederick. Fred, Fred was also invented, wasn't he, for satirical purposes. He was, mm. he, 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 you used him as a mouthpiece to, well, to take the piss. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question because actually when you're young in this business, if somebody tells you it'll be funny if you jump out a third floor window, you'll jump out a third floor window because you want to work out where the edges of you are. What is it you do? What is this thing? How, what would be funny? Would that be funny? Or would that? Then if you get an audience, you then need to sit down, and this is part of maturing, and it happened to me when I was doing Fred Dagg, if you get a bit of an audience, you really do need to sit down and think, well, what would I like to say? Um, because if you're just a hired gun, you've got to be careful that you're not hired by Hitler. If Hitler says, I'm having a birthday Saturday, can you come and be the act? You've got to work out what you think of that. And if you don't want to do that, you better work out why. And you better be able to articulate that argument as clearly as if you were making it without humour. Because you're talking to an audience and you have a responsibility to represent opinions that either genuinely are yours or an argument could be made or, you, or you're in a defensible position. You don't want to just get an easy laugh. I mean, that's when I was a kid, people used to get laughs by mentioning mother-in-laws. A lot of humour was sexist. A lot of my early stuff was sexist. Stupid, I'm ashamed of it. But that was the era. And, and it, it'll only be if people in the creative enterprise change the, their attitude on these issues that society will change. Because the, 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 the creative people are well ahead very often. I mean, we were reading Janet Frame novels at secondary school, for example, and they were describing the world that we lived in but the government was still putting lamb on ship and sending it to England and hoping for a good price. We weren't really responsible for ourselves at all. And yet here were, you know, people were absolutely earmarking the society we were growing up in. Where, where Kiwis saw Fred Dagg originally was in, was in current affairs programs. It was. Um, on the one television channel we had up until the um, until the mid-70s, 75 or 76. Mm. And I remember our bosses at the NZBC yep. fearing and loathing Fred Dagg. Yep. They saw him as a mischief maker. Mm. They saw him as someone who would quite possibly get them into trouble with the government. Yeah. We didn't handle satire very well in those days. Did no, we? it was pathetic. It was just embarrassing, stupid, immature. They were moronic. Most of them came from radio and didn't understand television at all. Television's a wonderfully exciting medium because it has a huge audience. It still has a huge audience. I know that the internet and so on have greatly altered the way people receive news and the way they can contribute and so on. But television still has an enormous market. If you, if you made a movie which had the audience of one episode of the games, you'd be a multi-millionaire overnight. Movies don't have anything like the people going to them that watch the average television program. Television is still 
the sort of people's medium in all sorts of ways. And people, and I'm typical, I, I don't think we had a television set in our house until I was about 12 or 14 or something. Um, but people have been watching it since then, and I'm typical, and we're very good at watching it. We, we see the smallest thing, we see embarrassment, we see inadequacy. If we see a, a person being interviewed saying, I'll tell you a good example was us. when we first started doing these interviews, we did them at Channel 9. And I realised after about a month that every time we did one, the Channel 9 national company lawyer was standing there. And I said, are you going to be here every week? And he said, yes. We're a very rich organisation, John. We don't want to be sued. And I said, well, it's not my principal intention to be sued. Why don't you explain what you're worried about? I'm a nice boy, I'll understand. And he said, OK, well, the one thing that you get into trouble with libel over is calling someone a liar. Don't call anyone a liar. I said, OK, would it be possible for Brian to say to me, are you telling the complete truth? And for me to say, can you give me a minute? <laughs> to just think about um, aspects of your very detailed question. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> and I thought, well, thank you. That's a really good comic idea. That's a miles better idea. It's the absence of the word liar that suggests liar to an audience. So, so now, once upon a time, that would have been difficult because the audience didn't understand the grammar of interviews and, and that sort of television until it had been watching it for a generation or so. But they now are incredibly perceptive and observant and they get tone, they do not miss a trick. So it's still, a, I think, a pretty exciting medium to be in. And it's also gone, so if you do something terrible, you can fix it up tomorrow by doing something halfway decent. You've been doing those weekly satirical TV interviews with Brian Dore uh, as the interviewer for a hell of a long time now. Mm. I mean, first, as you've just pointed out on we'll Channel 9... We'll get the hang Nine, of it soon. <laughs> practice makes perfect. Mm. And in more recent years on the ABC, and, and here's the thing, you're, you're always playing someone else. You're playing, I don't know, Paul Keating, you're playing John Howard, you're playing Bob Hawke. And the point of your attack is absolutely clear. Um, so you've got a take on their, on, on the persona of this prominent person. Prominent person is often a politician, but you don't try to look like them. No. That wouldn't be easy, actually. For, no, well, with, I did... With I did Ms. Gillard. Uh, no, no, no. Well, I did think when we were first doing them that... that um, television had become such an important part of the way that people market uh, goods, as you folk know, but also the way politicians market themselves and personalities market themselves. And so that politicians were now receiving media training in how to be, appear decisive and um, can we get your voice down a bit and um, when you answer the question, look directly at, you know, all this stuff because once upon a time politicians didn't do that and they were very easily sometimes trapped into saying silly things or looking the fools they were. Um, and um, I thought, well, it'd be nice to take that away because they're now so good at it that what interests me is not a sort of ad hominem argument that says that is a bad person. What should concern us is the value of the argument. What are they saying? They're talking essentially about the society we live in they're making recommendations about what ought to happen or how things ought to be done. Is that a reasonable argument? As I said before, we should be able to critique the argument as if we were not using humour as a tool. It should be reasonably sound. I don't mean to be too pompous about this, but you, you don't want to be too... You don't want to trivialise everything in order to get a cheap laugh. It's better to get... Um, it's better to represent your actual thinking about it. As I've got older, I've found this particularly interesting. I'm not interested in things the same way I was when I was 18. Cheap life would do then. Now I want to get at the sort of pith and sinew of the idea. So you don't, you don't look like um, the people that y you are, 
no. for, the, for the purpose of the interview, and you certainly don't sound like them. No. So there's no attempt to try to mimic um, vocal tone or... No, it's a democracy, you see, Ian, and yeah. so we are the government. Yeah. Mm. I, th I thought that it might be worthwhile if I just shot you a couple of questions and perhaps got you to answer as Julia Gillard. Very, very happy to do so. Just to try to see how this thing works. <laughs> or see if it works. <clears throat> um, it's true, isn't it, uh, Mrs Gillard, that before you became Prime Can Minister... Can I just correct you there very briefly, Ian? We don't know each other well, but I'm not Mrs Gillard. I'm Ms Gillard. <laughs> I'm not married to Mr Gillard. Oh. Miss Gillard will suffice nicely. I'll go back to the top of the question. Yes. It's true, isn't Otherwise, it? Otherwise, I thought it was going well. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, was going very well up till then. Mm. It's true, isn't it, Ms Gillard, that before you became Prime Minister, you promised that there would be no carbon tax. You promised that there would be no emissions trading scheme. That is incorrect, Ian, is it? <laughs> yes, that, 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 is, that is incorrect, Ian. I did not promise there would be no carbon tax. I promised no government I led would introduce a carbon tax. Are you familiar with the term loss leader? <laughs> uh, this is what we have to do before an election. What I meant was that the Labor Party, whose policies I was representing at the time, did not have as its current policy the introduction of a carbon tax. We then had an election, and the black box is still being looked at. It was a bit of a snarl up. And we had to stitch together a government in conversation with some independents, as a consequence of which we have a carbon tax. But I would argue that I was not leading that discussion. <laughs> and yet, Ms Gillard, no sooner had you taken over as Prime Minister then in fact, you announced that there would be a carbon tax. Yes, I was, standing, I was standing next to the people who forced me into that position while I made that statement. So, so it should have been clear to you, Ian. So, so effectively, you lied to the Australian people. No, I did not lie at all. The position changed. <laughs> I'm not a liar. I do recognise when a position changes. What, what happened that... When the carbon tax that, came in? That, that caused you to change your mind. I was asked whether I would like to be the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Mr I... Abbott was asked the same question and he got the answer wrong. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask you then how important you think it is for politicians to keep their promises? It's of the utmost importance for politicians to keep their promises. Uh, and uh, I would if I could. <laughs> can, you, can you think of any circumstance in which it is morally right to break a solemn promise that you have made to the Australian electorate? Yes, I can, although I've promised a friend of mine I would never re reveal the circumstances under which that would be the case. But yes, <laughs> in simple answer to your question. Well, to finish, now that the carbon tax is in fact in place, mm. contrary to the promise that you made before the election. It was not a promise. How's it, how's it going? Well, interesting question. Excellent question. I congratulate you on the question, Ian. I knew if we sat here long enough, you'd come up with an absolute cracker. <laughs> um, the answer to the question is that the carbon tax was introduced, as was the case in New Zealand, amid an absolute flurry of we'll all be murdered in our beds rhetoric, and nobody noticed it. It's in, people are paying it, it's the least of anybody's worries. It is not the cause of enormous price rises. Enormous price rises are caused by well-meaning folk in the retail industry not the carbon tax. So the ultimate result is that there's enormous relief and people have just got on with the business of repositioning the deck chair. Well, 
Thank you, Ms Gillard. And My pleasure. I'm here every Thursday. Yes. May I just say how particularly gorgeous you're looking this morning. It's Thank like you. The Games, that marvellous series about the Sydney Olympics, mm. we saw a fragment up there on the screen, mm. um, sort of in a parallel dimension. Is that the high point of the television work that you've done since you've been in Australia? I think it's pretty... I think it's a, it's a high point. It was a very interesting idea because um, um, it's not really about sport. It's about human organisation and all sorts of things about human relationships and stuff like that. Um, and it was... It's a sort of... Um, to talk about the grammar of television again, it's shot as a documentary, um, but it's written as a satire and played as a drama. Um, and that was quite unusual. It doesn't have uh, a laugh track. It doesn't have a live audience, so you're not being told when to laugh. That's up to you, the way it is in life. Um, and it's shot as a documentary because we wanted it to look as if it was kind of really happening. And I didn't fully understand this myself. What's the difference? I said to the... We got a couple of people to shoot it who were documentary makers. And I said to them, since I'm in this rather a lot, you better explain to me what shooting it like a documentary means. And they said, well, it's easy. For example, if you go out that door in a drama, there's a camera out there running. And when you come out the door, you walk into the shot from that camera. And that camera has known you were coming because it says that in the script. In a documentary, we have to follow you from here with a camera because the theoretical idea is we don't know you're going to go until you decide to leave. So in other words, the action leads the camera and the way the camera follows you. So that opened up a whole lot of real estate to us because you can walk into your own office in the games and say, excuse me, can you people get out of here? I'm about to make a private phone call. And they don't go because they're making a documentary. And I say, well, get out of, and I can turn away, which suggests I don't want you to hear, which makes you listen more avidly. So there are all sorts of little sub games that you can play in that, which most of which I was blissfully unaware of when we had the idea, but it's a rich field. It was wonderful fun and it was collaborative. I've always enjoyed the collaborating with people and that was just a wonderful cast and crew. You, you wrote and presented